I began to see this theme of teamwork and leadership as the key to success. Business of Architecture, Episode 326. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today, you'll hear from Eugene Cohn, one of the co-founders of the architecture firm Cohn Peterson Fox, or KPF. Eugene Cohn just released a book chronicling his remarkable career, including the challenges and successes of building this incredibly successful worldwide firm. The name of the book is The World by Design, the Story of a Global Architecture Firm. As you may know, KPF has designed many of the world's tallest buildings. In today's episode, you'll discover lessons on leadership, Eugene's early influences that shaped his career, and a behind-the-scenes look at the internal schism that almost split KPF in two, and how Eugene Cohn led from the helm to maintain the culture and unity of the firm, ensuring its success and legacy for many years to come. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's leading business training program for current and aspiring architecture firm leaders. Gene, tell me, how did this partnership happen? How, what was the genesis of KPF? Well, in the book, of course, I, I talk about my early years and what influenced me and where I worked. And I was very fortunate to have worked for some very good architects and at school to have been exposed to probably the world's best architect uh, over my period of time. So I was fortunate to have that influence. And uh, as I talk in the book, also having been a naval officer and trained for leadership, making tough decisions, looking at both ends of uh, both options of some decisions, you know, you do this, you do that. Having to do that in the Navy where it's rather serious, I learned how to do that quickly. And and with Shelley Fox, who was my classmate at Penn, who was in the Army while I was in the Navy during the Korean War, he also was an officer and learned similarly to make tough decisions and make them in a very short time. Sometimes you have very little time to make them. That was one thing. Two, I also love sports. And I coached a number of my kids' teams. And uh, inspiration, being a leader of the team and bringing them together was important. And for me, a great leader is one who brings people together, not causes them to go different ways and challenge each other, but to be as a team. And you do that by inspiring people. You also do that by When things go wrong, you don't blame everybody else. You take the blame. You got to take the blame when things go badly, and you you share the credit when things go well. I played by that rule because to me it was important, both in the military service, in the firm, and in my life in general. So if I suggest something and it fails, I take the blame. If it turns out successfully, I find enough people to share it with who participate and help. For me, leadership was very important in anything I do, uh, whether it's coaching kids' teams or coaching adult teams or leading a military unit or working in a firm. And also when I worked for a number of architects, not all were good leaders. And I saw the the problem when they took the credit and blamed everybody for any mistake and the impact it had on the people. And I was one of the people at the time, but I observed and I, uh, you know, and I used to fight back when I thought the, the boss was wrong and attacking somebody. But it just furthered my belief that if you create a firm, you know, you want to bring out the best in your people. You do want them to work together as a team. And in a way, architecture is not a one-person job. You know, I think the problem is you go to school and you do your design and you ask to present to the jury or the teachers and you take credit. It's my idea. It's, I did this. And you keep saying my idea. This is me, me, me. And not, you know, not we. And so you, you learn as a young architect that you're being judged by what you do. And therefore, if you do it well, you want to get the credit. But as you get older, you realize when you start working in an office that you're working with a lot of talented people. And some junior architect could have the best idea. If you don't allow those ideas to come forward, you probably miss the right thing. You, know, you miss the best idea. So I would always, and my partners do the same, give credit to Joe Blow, whoever he might be, who had the idea. It was his idea. But we developed it together, so it becomes a team effort. So for me, architecture was not just one person. Although the press loves to give credit to one name or two names, as if nobody else existed. It's like when they look at artists, 
you look and you say, you, know, you name the artist Picasso. Just assume everything Picasso did, he did. And no one else, and that may be the case, but no one else had anything to do with it. Probably not the case. And when you look at a writer, or you look at a poet, or you look at a painter, you look at a author of, of a book or a musician, it's always about the individual. But in those cases, the individual is playing the guitar. The, in, the individual is writing the book, or the individual is painting. So I always say, well, but architecture is different. Architecture, one person can't do it. Maybe a small house. You know, we work at projects on enormous scale, many buildings and millions and millions of dollars. You know that one person couldn't do it. So we decided that we would give credit to the whole team and not take it as Gene Cohn or Bill Patterson or Shelley Fox, but to the team. And that's been the way we work. So we give credit. And then if a certain person does a phenomenal job, that person gets identified as key to the success of that project. So by doing that, you, one, solve a problem for the team. They want to be given credit for what they do. They want to go home to their parents and show that their name is here. In the book, you notice I put everybody's name in the book. You go to the back. So everybody was a part of this. So it's sharing the credit. So as partners, as leaders, we should take the blame. But when it goes well, we give credit to the whole team. So that was our philosophy from day one. And it really worked. As a result, we built great team effort, people who are very loyal to the firm and who love to work together. And they, too, give credit to the younger people on their teams. So it's been a really ideal thing, and it's the way I believe it should work. And uh, when things go wrong, as I say, we will take the blame. My mistake or Bill's mistake or Shelley's, but Shelley passed away, unfortunately. Gene, in your book, you mention this idea of leadership working together as a team and you bring up the, the almost the the paradox of the architect which is we all want to be great designers we want to get a lot of the credit we're these artistic geniuses aspiring geniuses and you kind of allude to the fact that it's difficult to lead and create team out of that kind of mentality tell me how do you take these creative geniuses and form the baseball team so to speak i think we demonstrated to the young people let's start with them you know Bill Shelley and I had come to this agreement, and we all worked the same and believed the same. And as we took in new partners over the many years, uh, they understood how we worked and therefore followed suit. The younger people who joined the firm, you know, I knew that they'd love to go home and show their wife or their mother what they did and, they should, and, and take credit for that thing that they did on the building. But they, they do point out it's just a piece of the building. It's not the whole composition that they alone did. <laughs> so we, we allow for that, where you take credit for a certain detail or an elevation or a choice of material or something you did that's very special. But at the same time, you're part of a team that's doing it in other parts of the building, the same kind of thing. So it, it's easy to sell because everybody wants some credit. And there's nothing, I mean, I remember as a young architect to go home with my parents and point out that I had done so done this thing, you know, and showed them the building or that I had won this prize or whatever. They liked that. But at the same time, I was very clear that I worked for a great firm, a great team, and a lot of talented people. And uh, when I didn't agree with the partners of the firm, I also spoke up. But it was not about, it was the way they treated people, more so than what they were doing architecturally. See, I think the key is, if I just depend on my, my, my thoughts and my ideas alone, it may be fine, but with somebody else may actually have a better idea. And so what I began to see as we worked with others that they were talking about things I hadn't thought about, and they were good ideas. I said to myself, that's one another advantage of a team. I'm not going to think of everything, and my partners on the team will think of different things. And they did. As a result, the project was far more interesting. The results are better, and uh, we all enjoyed it because we all participated all contributed, more than participation, actually contributed to the success of the project. So that, that was an important lesson for me that I kept, kept remembering. And then, of course, in the military, you depend on others. You just cannot, the military is designed uh, with you know, uh, sharing this load with different ranked people. And it's not one person. It's not one officer that, can t that does it all. It's a whole group of people to network. Yeah, as I recall, the military idea was you cannot lead more than four people at any one time, three to four people. 
if you're you know, a sergeant, you're responsible for three corporals, as an example. If you're an officer, you're responsible for three junior officers, or four, depending on the situation. It was this idea of units and teams working together to get to the top where there's a, a general who has other general. Well, Eisenhower, take a good thing, it's a D-Day. Eisenhower was in charge of the whole invasion. But he had four or five generals under him, like Patton, Montgomery from England, uh, and others. And so he had all generals that he could, who he would pass down things to, and they would then deal with their units. And so it, if you see the whole thing working in a network, uh, it starts really basically three people, four people that range that work together. So uh, again, team, uh, again, sharing leadership, sharing decision-making and uh, achieving the goals that are set by the commanding officer or the lead architect or the client. <laughs> yeah, that, again, these were experiences. I mean, it's like going through your whole life and realizing these experiences come along. And I began to see this theme of teamwork and leadership working with a team uh, as a key to success and not as a one person making all the decisions all the way through. No matter how good you are, you can't have the best idea about everything. And other people have as good or better ideas, and so I use the best idea. Gene, growing up, who do you think had the bigger influence on you, your mother, your father? You do talk about your mother in the book, and what was the impact that you felt that she had on your life? That's a good question. She was a major influence. So my dad was a doctor uh, and was in medicine, in research medicine. Uh, he was very conservative. And uh, his whole family, his side, were all doctors. He wanted me to be a doctor. And I think I disappointed him for a while by choosing another profession. Uh, although by the time he passed away, I was starting to do well, so I think he was comfortable that I was doing okay. Um, but my mother um, did not necessarily want me to be a doctor unless I wanted to. And she uh, was an unbelievably talented lady. So I got to appreciate women and leadership roles long ago, not needing anybody's campaign to convince me. My mother ran a major business, ran a major family. She ran the entire family, not just my father and myself, but all the brothers, sisters, cousins. They all came to her for advice. And she ran them, and she was the boss lady, so to speak, in a very nice way. But uh, what, I, what, what she did, she was a very creative person, so she was designing dresses. And, and knew all the top designers uh, at the time. She helped my dad out, who's, my, my parents went through the Depression and lost all their money. All their, It was a bad time. And I, I was born in the Depression, so uh, I experienced some of it. But they, they suffered dramatically. And my mother started to work to help my dad because he lost all his money and his business. He had been in research. So I, I watched her operate because she was pretty amazing. She was charming. I mean, truly charming lady, but committed, dedicated, and tough. She did not give in. If she didn't, if she didn't agree with you, you didn't, she didn't agree with you. I mean, <laughs> it's that simple. And she wanted me to do what I wanted to do, which I, I painted with her. From age five, I started to paint. She was a, she was a great painter. And uh, as a weekend painter, she worked during the week as dress business. She became, she had a show at the Guggenheim when she hit 100. And it was one of the best shows of, ever at the Guggenheim. I mean, the people who installed it from the Guggenheim said they loved it because it's her life's work and the story of her life through art. And it was, there were wonderful paintings. And she talked, at age 100, stood on her feet for three hours at Guggenheim explaining the art. And she, she could do paintings that were realistic to abstract to creative things and and she was amazing so one day she was very talented and two she was a great leader because she led the entire family and three she ran a marvelous business and one so i learned a couple of important things many more but two i point out one she treated everybody who worked for with respect no matter their color their religion their race where they're from, or their job, if they were packing dresses to ship them, delivering them, or helping her sell, or fixing them, you know, seamstress. She treated them all wonderfully. Great respect, and people all love her. And the other thing she did well is she, she wanted to raise me 
and do their business at the same time. Not easy because I was a little boy, and she didn't want to leave me a babysitter. She wanted to have an influence. So I would be around. The, she put the business in her house for a while, and my bedroom was a dressing room, which was very interesting <laughs> as I grew up. Um, but my mother wanted to be sure I, I was there. So I would watch her at times. I'd be trying to do my homework, but i hear her selling. And a lady would come up to her and say, Hannah, I love this dress. I want to buy this dress. My mother says, you can't have it. And this lady almost <laughs> cried. But Hannah, I love this dress. She says, not for you. And she wouldn't sell it. So I went up to my mother that evening after the woman left. I said, mother, that lady wanted to buy that dress for a lot of money. Why won't she sell it? She said, Gina, it was the wrong dress for her. I know it. I can't sell it to her. Uh, and she would someday discover it. Well, you know, it taught me about ethics, morality, uh, ethics, and, and how to, even in architecture, I would never propose something I didn't agree. It was good. So it was, that was an important lesson. So I learned about respect for people and about um, doing the right thing when it comes to your product. And I wouldn't recommend a building I thought was terrible to somebody. And I mean, even if they liked it, I wouldn't. We, and we don't. We, we will not do a building we think is wrong for them. So that was my mother. And uh, so I saw about a woman who was a leader, who was strong, talented, dedicated, and honorable. And these were things I, I wanted to be like. I, I thought were great. Now, not that my dad wasn't, but he was not as outgoing. He was a research medicine and he was a different background, you know. So, but my mother was a great, I would say the major early influence in my life was my mother. And she encouraged me to take, study architecture. Because she went to the trouble of talking to the dean of the University of Pennsylvania for advice. And he said that architecture is a great course to take because it prepares you for a lot of things in the future besides being an architect. Gene, you have a great story in your book talking about how Le Corbusier came and spoke at school and had just an incredible lecture, put all these drawings on the wall, and there was a frenzy as he's left. The students rushed over each other to try to grab one of these drawings, and you said that you didn't because you were too polite. Well, it, it was my mother said, if you don't own it, you don't take it. Huh? Well, I thought Corbusier had sketched all these beautiful, beautiful stuff, I mean, very big. And in summer, we got to the Museum of Modern Art, and I would see them. I'd be so upset that I could have had one. <laughs> Just boom, you know? And then do it. I was, I was the one next to the wall. And everybody came piling. I could have just taken it off. So I, I in a way, regretted having not done that. But um, I felt good that I, my, I'm not sure how good I felt afterwards because other people had them and I didn't. Again, that was a, a lesson about my mother's. It's a great story, but it's one that still bothers me. <laughs> what I mean by bothering me, because I do run across these drawings. He must have done 20 or 25 about every aspect he talked about. The magic markers, I mean, it was fabulous. Spoke in French, which you got to understand as he drew everything. And then it comes over to you and places it on the wall right by you, and you want to say, give it to me, you know. Um, so it was a great lesson and a great opportunity, which I missed. But um, I never forgot the story or the, or the lecture. It was one of the best I'd ever heard. Gene, you, you talk about in when the firm was young, you reached out to your network of contact. You mentioned coming to California, talking with a contact who knew you from when you were younger in school, and he gave you some advice. He said that the work that you turn down will determine much of your success. Now, the very first year of practice, you talk about in the book having this incredible commission in I Iran that you were presented with and had to make a very difficult decision. Tell us about that story and how that occurrence has influenced your view on business and how it affected the future. Good question. In fact, probably the best story in the book because it's like looking at a crossroads that you had to make a decision which way to go. If you made the wrong one, you be in a lot of trouble. If you made the right one, you could succeed. Of course, it was that important. Having, had wor having worked in Iran before, I kind of knew the downsides as well as the upsides. And there are more downsides, actually, than upsides, other than if they paid you, you would have some good money to get started. And we, we had no money. I mean, it was really a tough period. So the, the, uh, the whole decision, the person that you referred to actually lived in New York, but took me to California, where he rented a house and brought his whole family for two or three months. And I was his lifeguard. I'd been, been a lifeguard in places, and he brought me along to teach swimming to the kids and prevent them from drowning, basically, guest drowning. 
And uh, we rented a beautiful ho- Judy Holiday's house. It was a marvelous place, you know. And so it's great to be in Hollywood and California, beautiful weather and pretty ladies and teaching, swimming and, you know, all that. So, so that was an interesting experience. But he was the one then when, when I, I was younger at that time, when I wanted to start the firm, uh, he had been such a great success that I thought his name was Matthew Forbes. And he had owned one third of J.P. Lorelei, which made 10 cigarettes and back in those days and uh, very successful, very rich. And I wanted his advice because he was a big success. Now, I did not expect the advice he gave me. I thought, well, he'd either recommend he loan me some money or he'd know somebody who was about to do a building. And all he said was that, Gene, you will be judged by your, your success will be based on the work you turn down. And I looked at him, and we had no work, <laughs> and we're about to have to turn down work. And I thought, well, this is the strangest advice I've ever had. But I thought about it a lot, and he was absolutely right. Uh, you, you, you know, you can get do bad work because you work with the wrong clients, or they can have you do a lot of work and never get paid, and you're financially strapped. So he was right. And having worked in Iran, and I've been through some of the more difficult periods of arriving in the middle of the morning, middle of the night, your hotel room's not there, you paid for it, but they somehow lost your room. And uh, where they don't, where they negotiate with you before you leave, that you have to make your plane. Back then it was tough. And, you know, they take you to this great French club, caviar and vodka, and by the time you're done, you can't hardly think, and then they say, well, you have to negotiate. Your plane's are like two hours or three. So, it, and they did it in Farsi, so the whole thing was, uh, you know, a disaster. And then you may not get paid for a long time. But why it was the crossroads, okay, is that that moment was a few months before the Shah would be a, would, would be forced out. And once the Shah was forced out of Iran, uh, nobody got paid. Zero. So we would have invested six months of effort and work. And then, then we've been forced to leave without any pay. It took years before any money came due to lawsuits. We would have no money, in debt, and no work. But we stayed. We turned it down. And I think in the book I point out it was in Shelley Fox's kitchen in Stanford, Connecticut, on a Sunday that we did this. We call, I had a call and tell them the, 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 the president of the bank. They, and, I, and I said in the book they offered us $1.3 million just to do the design in 1976. So think about what that would be worth today. And we hear up toning it down, and we have no work and no money. But that same Sunday, in the Sunday Times, was a small article about ABC buying the army on the Upper West Side on 66 between Columbus and Central Park West. And we quickly turned out I knew a VP and Shelley Fox knew a VP at ABC. We made our calls. We got ourselves an interview. And we won the interview. We, it turned out we were the only ones to interview. And that led to the first, which was the Armory, as I mentioned in the book. And we did a one-hour-long soap opera studio, which required a long corridor with a lot of sets. And the Armory was perfect. We did that, and then the master plan for all of the ABC work on the Upper West Side, and ended up doing 17 projects, just for ABC. And they paid within 10 days of our bill. We didn't have to borrow money. Then Tom Klosnick, who was a good friend in Chicago, had ABC as a tenant. And ABC was thinking of leaving his building, going to a new building. So he called me and said, Gene, I think you're working for ABC. I said, yeah. Now, he thought we had a lot of influence. We didn't have a lot of influence. But he said, I want you to come to Chicago. We want you to do a building here that could ABC would move into. And so I said, great. So Bill Paris and I flew to Chicago, met with Tom, and saw the site, which was an edge site on the river. And we started the job. And did this wonderful building called 333 Wacker Drive, it was curved. ABC made the decision not to move, so he put the building on hold, but he put it on, on a shelf above his desk. And so every day he saw it, he loved that building. And one year later, he commissioned us to start work with no tenant. And it became a famous building, it got the best publicity, very great stories written about it. And that building's success led us to one building after the other, it's in the book. You know, from Procter & Gamble, World Headquarters, World Bank, which in the first nine, ten years, we were doing major work and very successful work. So all those things, right, 
turning down Iran, because well, we all we never had ABC, never bothered with it. We never would have gotten 333 Wacker, and then we're not allowed to Procter and Gamble. I could go on and on, as I do in the book. But project after project came as well. And Paul Goldberg, who uh, was in one of our sessions in Philadelphia, talks about that, because he wrote about it. He loved that building. And he was doing articles about us in the first 10 years that were amazing, including a major article in the New York Times Magazine section that we were supposed to be on the cover. Unfortunately, the astronauts were killed in an unfortunate accident, and they made the cover. They would have preferred us to make the cover, I know, because they'd be alive. So that was the key. I mean, all of a sudden, in the first nine, really nine years, we were extremely well-known and uh, had made major success in a very, very short time. And it was really because Bill Shelley and I worked so well together, and we had brought on young talent that was very good and doing great work. It was, a, it was the right decision. So very often in life, you do have to come to a crossroads where you make a tough decision. And I mean, it didn't take long for us to realize we had, because when the Shah was booted out, you know, there was no money, and we had been a disaster. Gene, in your book, you talk about you're, you're on a retreat in 2009, of course. We just had, there, we know what happened in the economy during that time period. You're enjoy, enjoying some nice time, apparently, with your, um, with your family at the time. And you get a phone call from the partner in the London office, one of the partners in the London office that just set off a series of events that literally, our, our audience can go read the book. I highly encourage you to read the entire book, uh, but that chapter particularly hit me like a ton of bricks. Gene, tell us what exactly was it that happened and walk me through the emotions and how you dealt with that and and came through to today. I need to do a little background first. Is that, that when I always would look at the number of partners I thought that could be leaders of the firm if something happened to me or for replacing me. And we had four at the time that I thought had the, the skills to be leaders of the firm. One was Lee Palosano, who was the star of that chapter, unfortunately. Uh, and then the other was uh, Greg Clement, who passed away at age 53 from cancer. The other was Paul Katz, who died at age 57. Uh, big guy, he was like 6'6", six, six, and great personality. Clients loved him, and he, he would travel the world. He was just uh, a great guy. Plus, he'd carry my suitcase. He always felt sorry for me. <laughs> He was just a great guy, and clients loved him. He passed away at age 57 from cancer. And that left, uh, and then uh, Jamie Von Klemper, who is the current president, who is terrific and, frankly, uh, um, has done a phenomenal job. So, uh, But he was the fourth ranking in that group uh, because he was younger and the others had more experience. But Lee was the oldest and had worked with us from the start of the firm and had been worked for Kevin Roche. Uh, back then, uh, a number of years before. So, a capable guy. I, we put him in charge of the London office, and he did a very good job there for a long time. Uh, not everything went well, but, but, but basically it was pretty good. And he was talented, hardworking, good with clients, but he was pretty much a loner, which I began to see and worry about. There's a conference called MIPID, which is an international real estate conference. It takes place in Cannes every year in March. And we would all, a number of partners would go. I've been I was the one who started it. I've been there the 30th year this year. But uh, when Lee came, I noticed that he didn't pay attention or stay in part with, with the partners. He would go off and do things by himself and never include the partners in meetings with clients and so forth. He seemed strange. So, I mean, I guess he had been cooking this idea for a while. Anyhow, uh, but I mean, he had done a wonderful job and we had very good partners there doing really excellent work. And I was very proud of the London office. And I would go there once a month or two, you know, but I couldn't tell there was anything going wrong. I knew that Lee was a tough guy, but otherwise the firm was doing well. So uh, we made him president of the whole firm, and that's when things started to change. I'm not sure in the book whether I go in great detail, but behind the scenes, he had hired a firm, a law firm in California, to help him reorganize the entire plan of the firm and shift the power to London that the U.S. had where all their offices would be under the London office, and a lot of the work we were doing under London, not New York, to reduce the strength of New York. We didn't know that for a whole year and then discovered that. And then the chapter tells a lot about what was going on. Once I heard that, I said, he, he called, so I'll tell you what happened. So 
I was getting some of this stuff and getting a little concerned. And then one uh, was a Friday or Saturday, I can't remember now, maybe it was a Friday afternoon I was home in Connecticut at my house up there. And I get a call, I knew, actually noon time, I get a call from Lee telling me that I'm going to hear some news soon in the uh, financial, financial Times, uh, that he had spoken to them about his taking over. Well, I have to back up. I've got one very important thing. He came to see me in New York a, couple, about a month before this whole situation to discuss possibly his taking over the London office and, you know, working together, but he would basically with his partners own it and uh, pay us for our, you know, interest. And I said, Lee, uh, the London office is not for sale. It's important to our legacy and our history. And, and we want to be a global firm. And to be a global firm, we need to be in London. So, no, I don't think we can do that. He didn't take no for the answer. He went and hired a financial advisor, I guess, for the whole offered program together. So then about a month or so later, he called me at my home and said that he was taking over the office. I said, Lee, you can't take over the office. We're not selling it. He says, well, we're, we're taking it over and we'll work it out somehow. I said, well, you know, we're shocked. <laughs> and, I, and he said, look, I had a financial advisor. We put together a whole package. And I'll get you, you'll have it in a few minutes. I said, Lee, I'm not in the city. I'm up in Connecticut in the country. Uh, there's no <laughs> way I can get it. He said, oh, no, no. The gentleman's been outside your house waiting for this moment. And I had spotted somebody standing on that side. Didn't think about it. And sure enough, guy, we, goes, we open the door. There he is with his package. And then I just, and then Lee calls the next day and tells me that he also talked to the Financial Times. And there'll be a big article about his taking over the London office and other aspects of the firm. I said, Lee, you, you know, you can't. We haven't made a deal or anything. So, but he did it anyhow. So now we're really at war because it's really bad. So I decided... So I had to go to London and take over. And while we talked about it, things in New York for a while, it just seemed to me there was no way to leave him in charge in London, getting new work for himself while we're <laughs> not paying attention or doing anything about it. So I told my wife, I said, we're moving to London, get ready. And we did. We just moved over. I got an apartment in a week or two and we moved in and um, I stayed there for three years. And took over the office. But it wasn't that simple. Because Lee was still there. It's very difficult to fire people in the UK. Very difficult. And I had to do, I work with lawyers to get the right, whatever you're supposed to do. It's more complicated. So I started investigating all that he was doing. You know, I I, saw, I, I would meet every night with all the staff. And I had an attorney there to help them decide whether they should go with Lee or with us. But I had to convince this firm to stay with us and not become Lee's. We ended up with 75% of the staff, 75% of the projects. We took all the partners but one. And it was a big book. I encourage our audience to go to the book, not only for the background of everything else Mr. Cohn has shared with us today, but also the full story. And we also have the pleasure of having with us today Clifford Pearson. Clifford, you played an integral part in putting the book together, no doubt, interviews. I would just like to take a few minutes here to get your perspective on, third-party perspective, on putting together this book and some of the key takeaways for you personally, if that's okay. Sure, sure. sure. I mean, I started working with Gene on the book, I guess about three or four years ago, well before I came to KPF. So I was working on it as a freelance project, and I had known Gene for quite a while. And I'd been telling him for a while, Gene, you have all these great stories you have to put them all in one place. And I remember the day before you left for London, because there was an event at the Harvard Club, and there was a dinner afterwards, and you were 78 years old at the time, and you and Barbara were about to move to London, literally, I think the next day or two later. And he was like a 28-year-old kid. <laughs> he was There was like this glint in his eyes. And he knew that there was a big challenge. But it was clear that you were you were looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I like the idea of going over it. <laughs> it was like a, a championship boxer yeah. coming back after a while 
and having a big match. And you could tell he was he was looking forward to it. And I I knew immediately there's no way that Lee Palisano was going to get away with this. That matched up against Gene Cohen. And that's when I realized, you know, there's a book here. And there's a lot of drama. But what that showed me was what was at stake. Here you were at an age when a lot of people are retiring. But you had built up something that was incredibly important to you, but also, I think, to the profession of architecture. And you understood what was at stake and that it was worth fighting for. That's true. I mean, I did intend to fight until we won. So no question. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when I started thinking, well, how did you get to that point? What were the stories before that that laid the foundation for you at age 78 saying, I'm going to keep fighting? And then there's, you know, 10, 12 years after that, where the firm is now maybe more successful than it's ever yeah. been before. Well, for me, the firm is not a job. It's, it's a passion. It's part of my life. Like it's a member of the family. So I, I wasn't about to give it up that quickly or let somebody ruin it. So I, I can be a tough fighter. <laughs> well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Thank you. Cliff for putting together the book, spearheading that. Gene, thank you for sharing your experiences in the form of a book and also for joining us here today on the Business of Architecture podcast. Okay, my pleasure. And Cliff was a great person to work with, so it's been a lot of fun. Thank you for the opportunity. And that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed my conversation today with Eugene Cohn and Clifford Pearson. If you did, I'd appreciate a review on iTunes. This is what helps other people find the podcast and also allows me to hear directly from you. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so they can do their best work and enjoy greater freedom, fulfillment, and financial reward. Because, you see, it likely isn't your architecture or design skills that hold you back as a firm owner. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. If you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash training to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe.